Our country is historically a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation. It was founded on the Protestant Reformation, and the Bible was our basic book. Out of the Bible came the establishment of our Constitution, even as the Dutch Republic established their Constitution. Uh, in beginning my book, um, I start out with these particular, with my thesis, in that uh, how would Satan's Jesuit general make the Pope the theocratic universal monarch of a world as foretold in the scripture of truth? He would elect an absolute military dictator loyal to Rome in every nation. And he had done this in England by 1800 and in America by 1900. He then would start the second 30 years war from 1914 to 1945. And some of the benefits would be the installation of Russia's Roman Catholic Grand Inquisitor. Yes, Stalin was a Catholic. He was trained by Jesuits at Tiflis Seminary. And uh, he was a favorite of, uh, of Cardinal Agagnian, who was the head of the KGB. Uh, the installation of Benito Mussolini, who was the one who restored the temple power to the Pope to break up the Ottoman Empire so that they can start uh, the whole scenario in the Middle East. And they did this all through Shriner Freemasonry. I also believe that they started the nuclear war hoax, and on that nuclear war hoax, namely airborne nuclear war, that they would use that as a basis for the Cold War. And with the Cold War, we would never interfere with all the communist advances being taken in Russia and China and so on. We go on a little bit more here, and we see that uh, the nuclear war hoax would give birth to the Cold War. And this great deception would enable the Jesuit general to install dictators around the world who would be secretly or openly loyal to the Pope. He would accomplish this using his international intelligence community, the KGB in the East, and the CIA in the West. They both work together. And one of the major liaisons between the KGB and the CIA was James Jesus Angleton, that Knight of Malta and that slave of Cardinal Spellman. Um, and then they would set up their Federal Reserve Bank. The Class A stockholders of the Federal Reserve Bank are Chase and Citibank. Both of those are run by the Knights of Malta. Uh, Martin F. Shea and Francis F. Stankard in the past. For 45 years, no nation would seriously interfere with the Pope's Cold War. By the time of its supposed termination in 1989, thereby enabling the Vatican's military industrial complex to give high technology to Red China, the Jesuit general would achieve his goals, including the revival of the Pope's Holy Roman Empire, centered in a reunited Germany. And that's what he wants. World War II destroyed German Protestantism. It destroyed the most beautiful Protestant city in Germany called Dresden. It destroyed, which was a non-military target, it destroyed the most beautiful Protestant church in Germany called our Church of Our Lady. So it was the utter annihilation of German Lutheranism. Then we go on down here. One of the major victories for the general would be the taking of Jerusalem by his Torah-despising Masonic Jewish Zionists. We must always separate Zionism from the Jewish people. I believe the Lord's beloved Jewish people have many promises yet to inherit, but the Zionists work for the Pope and they are Masonic. Okay, next. With every nation now subordinated to the temple power of the Pope, the Holy Roman em American Empire must now be destroyed. For it is the world's haven for heretics and liberals, quote unquote, condemned by the Jesuits in their evil council of Trent. As the Pope sought to overthrow the Protestants of England with the Spanish Armada, so the Jesuits are seeking to destroy the peoples of North America with a triple Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion. By that time, many of the nation's Jews will have been destroyed by an American fascist dictator, the concentration camps being already in place. Jewish survivors will have been driven back to Zionist Israel to face their final annihilation to be attempted by the risen Pope, the Antichrist. And if you read Revelation 17.10, an eighth king is coming, he's one of the seven, and I believe it will be that seventh papal Roman Caesar who will be the Antichrist. So why was, pope, why was President Kennedy killed? In following the lead of pro-communist Pope John XXIII and his second Vatican Council, he sought to end the Cold War, including the war in Vietnam. He also attempted to end the reign of the CIA, but as Pope John XXIII died of a fast-growing cancer, just like Jack Ruby, and was replaced with another Cold Warrior president, uh, was replaced by secret Cold Warrior Pope Paul VI. Even so, Kennedy died and was replaced with another Cold Warrior President Lyndon Johnson. Through these acts of defying the Pope's temporal power, the president became a usurper and a tyrant, according to the Vatican's canon law, namely Thomas Aquinas, that has never changed. And I have a particular ex-Jesuit friend who's helped me research this, and he found a, a copy of uh, some Theologica written in 1887, and he has a very quote for this. Through these acts of defying the Pope's temporal power, he became a usurper, and then uh, 
then he, then uh, Kennedy was assassinated by the Jesuit General's international intelligence community, domestically overseen by the American Pope, Francis Cardinal Spellman. Spellman was in control of the CIA through John McCone. John McCone was a Knight of Malta. Spellman was also in control of the FBI through his wonderful Shriner Freemason, J. Edgar Hoover. Okay, and J. Edgar Hoover, his third in command, was Cartha D. DeLoach. Cartha D. DeLoach was a Knight of Malta. Both covered up uh, evidence for the Kennedy assassination. Okay. The present Archbishop, Edward Cardinal Egan, will continue this great Jesuit cover-up, he having ignited America's present papal crusade against the Islamic peoples of the Middle East and Central Asia through the attack and demolition of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, carried out by his loyal soldiers within the Central Intelligence Agency, including its CFR, CIA director, and Knight of Malta, George J. Tenet. Yes, so George J. Tenet, a Knight of Malta, head of the CIA, helped to carry this out with the wonderful work of Michael Rupert that we've seen. Same way in Kennedy's day was John McCone that carried out the assassination who was the head of the CIA. And uh, through a tenant in the high-level Masonic Bush House of Stewart and the Bin Laden family dynasties tied together through the Carlisle Group, its CEO being another CIA CFR member and Knight of Malta, Frank C. Carlucci. And Mr. Carlucci, one of his old wrestling buddies, was Mr. Rumsfeld of the Secretary of Defense. So they're good fascist buddies. <clears throat> Yet another act of bold high treason will result in the mass murder of, million of millions of Muslims. Remember, this is not a war against terrorism. This is a war against the Muslim peoples. Osama bin Laden, Yasser Arafat, the, pr the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Saddam Hussein are all Masonic brethren. They all work together. George Bush, Skull and Bones, his father, a Shriner Freemasonry, his uncle, Prescott Bush Jr., a Knight of Malta. They all work together and they're gonna orchestrate through this war everything they want and it's gonna be to the destruction of the Muslim peoples, not those Muslim leaders. That's why we can't find Osama bin Laden. Heck, they gave him, they gave him promised software. Okay. I believe that to shed another act of bold high treason will result in this, this murder, the destruction of Mecca, Medina and the Jerusalem mosques, including the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque. Remember, this is a war on the Muslim holy shrines because they destroyed the Protestant churches of Germany in World War II. They're going to get the Muslim shrines now. And it's also going to be for the, to, will it successfully incite foreign and domestic Islamic fanatics to invade and destroy the white apostate heretic and liberal peoples of post-Reformation America to the delight of the black pope. So what we have here in America is we have a Bible-rejecting nation. We can't have the Bible in public school anymore. And so as a result of that, our people now have departed from the Word of God. We've become a mixed people. We, we have no unity whatsoever among ourselves anymore. And so as a result of that, we will be easily conquered by a unified Muslim host, a unified Russian host, and a unified Chinese host. And we might as well include a unified Mexican host. They're all going to be coming up into our country in the future. Okay. Briefly, five empires. According to the book of Daniel, we are living according to the book of Luke during the times of the Gentiles. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The Jews do not control Jerusalem. They have never controlled Jerusalem since 606, and they do not control it now. The people that control Jerusalem are the Masonic Jewish Zionists, Mr. Shimon Perez is a Mason. In fact, he was trained by Jesuits as a young man when he grew up in Poland. He's Jesuit trained. Now we understand why Shimon Perez deeded the old city of Jerusalem to the Vatican in September of 1993. Middle Persia, Greece, Rome. At this time was what we're concerned about, Rome that's, that's the Holy Roman Empire. Rome never ceased to be a political empire, but it got religion in 312, 313 with Constantine. Later on in 606, the spiritual power, universal spiritual power was conferred on the Pope by Phocus, who was a dictator. And the temporal power was conferred 150 later by Pepin in 756. So these two powers are very key in understanding the papacy. Whenever you see the papal flag, you see two keys. One is a temporal power, the other is a spiritual power. 
The spiritual, the temporal power means that the Pope, the Papal Caesar, has the right to rule every government of the world. Every one of them. That's why when the Pope gets off his airplane, the first thing he does, he gets down and he kisses the ground. It's not because he's glad to be here. It's not an act of obeisance. It's an act of, of, of claiming that it belongs to him. And the last kingdom will be after this, uh, the Roman kingdom is destroyed with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will establish his messianic kingdom, which is what he came to do. He will institute his Davidic kingdom that he promised to the nation of Israel. He never came up to set the church up to begin with. He came to confirm the promises made unto the fathers according to Romans 15, 8. And one of those promises is that they would have a land forever that had been promised to them by, uh, to Abraham. Okay. Okay, next. The coming prince... The Coming Prince, I recommend for all your libraries, it is the explanation for the 70 weeks of Daniel. Okay. Written by Sir Robert Anderson, go ahead, an English knight. In the night. Okay. okay, Jordan. Pardon my scribble. From the commandment to restore Jerusalem, which was in 445 BC, you'll find this in the book of Nehemiah, to Messiah the Prince, April 6, 32 AD was exactly to the day, 483 years, 69 weeks of years. After that period of time, Messiah was cut off, shortly cut off thereafter in 32 AD. 70 AD, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Those two events, the cutting off of Messiah and the Jerusalem temple destroyed, are two events in between the 69th and 70th week. The 70th week will begin when the coming Roman Caesar, a coming pope, will make a firm agreement with Israel for seven years. Papal worship, another classic you need. It shows that Romanism and its doctrines and practice has nothing to do with true biblical Christianity, has nothing to do with the Word of God. Romanism has been the greatest persecutor of those of us who believe the Bible in history. In fact, my Protestant forefathers, the Dutch, used to have caps that they wore when they were warring against the papacy in Philip II. And on those caps, they had a crescent on it, and it said, rather Turkish than Popish. Next. We've already seen that. We've already seen that. We've already seen that. Yes. Okay. We have the supremacy of the papal Roman Caesar in the Dark Ages. Take either date, whatever you want to start with, to 1517 AD. Then we have the Protestant Reformation, because with Martin Luther, 1517 to the present. Supremacy of the Word of God over the supremacy of the Word of the Priests. We have the Counter-Reformation. This is important to us because this is what the Jesuits started to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And the Reformation, you want to remember this. Regardless of your religious faith, the Reformation gave us three things. The freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of worship. You have the right to choose what you want to believe about God. You have the right to choose what you want to write, providing you're going to assume responsibility for it. Those, that freedom of conscience is imperative to have a prosperous civilization. So you take that freedom of conscience and you apply that to science, and now you can begin to develop new sciences. And that's why the Protestant West was the leader in developing culture and science. Okay. Now we have the New Age movement. The New Age movement is started by Father Je Jesuit Teilhard de Cardin, the father of the New Age. That is a stepping stone to the return of the Dark Ages with the supremacy of the Roman Caesar, and then ultimately the return of the Son of God to establish his millennial kingdom. Again, I mentioned the Pope's two keys. We have the universal spiritual power and his universal temporal power by Pepin. The meridian of that power was what I call the demon Pope Innocent III who murdered all the Abigenses and killed nearly all the Waldenses. He said, catch and kill those little foxes, and he sent out his French army to get them. The Company of Jesus is totally de dedicated to the restoration of the Papal Caesar's universal temporal power, founded upon his universal spiritual power. The risen Papal Caesar intends to impose his temporal power over every nation on earth while ruling from Solomon's yet to be rebuilt third temple in Jerusalem. That's what the Crusades were all about. That's what this present war is all about. The rebuilding of Solomon's temple. Okay. Okay. Yeah, next. Oh, you got that. Excuse me. Pardon me. Okay, who is the Pope? This is what he has said of himself. For the Pope holdeth place on earth not simply of a man, but of the one true God. That's who he thinks he is. 
I have authority of the king of kings. I am all in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, have but one consistory. And I am able to do almost all that God can do. What therefore can you make of me but God? Papal bull, unum sanctum. Pope Boniface. I refuse the Pope. We the popes hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Pope Leo the Thirteenth, eighteen ninety four. Nothing has changed. Go next. This is the seal of the Jesuit general created by Ignatius Loyola himself, the founder of the Jesuits. On my book, you'll see. You'll see the, the points. There are 36 points on that book. If you add them up, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6, when you get to 36, when you, get to, when you add all 36 up together, you get 666. You get 666. Okay, next. Ignatius Loyola, again, IHS. The IHS stands for Isis Horus Seb. It is an Egyptian god worship. He's the father of Jesuit gen general. He was a white Gentile. He was not a Jew. He was a house of Basque of Loyola, born into wealth and power. And uh, he was also part of the Spanish Alumbrados, which today we know as the Illuminati. Okay. My first phase of the book, I give you a, uh, this is a, a newer edition that I've added to this, but here is one of the quotes from Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica, 1887. They heretics deserve not only to be separated from, from the church by excommunication, but also to be severed from the world by death. Much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are convicted of heresy, to be not only excommunicated, but even put to death. After the first and second admonition, if he, the heretic, is yet stubborn, the church, by excommunicating him and separating him from the church, delivers him to the secular tribunal to be exterminated thereby from the world by death. And that is exactly what Joseph Stalin did to millions of Orthodox Christians. That's exactly what Joseph Stalin did to many, many hundreds of thousands of Lutheran Germans when he sent them all to Siberia. This is a portion of the Jesuit oath, the fourth degree, and it is not the alleged Jesuit oath. It is the oath taken by Jesuits of a fourth vowel, and that constitutes 2% of the order. And you have to be in the order for 31 years to be able to take this vow. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness agents in any place, wherever I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my uttermost to extirpate the heretical Protestants or liberals' doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, regal or otherwise. That's conspiracy. Next. Furthermore, I promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will neither spare age, sex, or condition, that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to exterminate forever their execrable race. And when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith and the Society of Jesus. We are going to understand lots of history from this paragraph. Next. What is a Protestant? A Protestant is someone who, who used to, not anymore, that's all taken over by high-level Shrine or Freemasonry. I don't know of a Protestant church I'd want to go to. But a Protestant used to be someone who protested the papal power and who believed the Bible to be the final authority of faith and practice. These were deemed heretics by the Vatican and determined to be killed. The term liberal includes Roman Catholics who believe freedom of speech and freedom of the press because there are some Catholics who believe that. There are some priests who believe that. And that's why Hitler's Nazi SS put about 2,500 Catholic priests to death because those Catholic priests resisted the power of the Jesuits SS. Okay, next. History of Romanism, I feel, is the greatest history ever written on it. It was written in 1845 by a great Berean pastor, John Dowling. Next. In this, he shows how yeah, he quotes in the Latin the, the destruction of the right to private judgment in reading the scriptures. 
and the liberty of the press is forbidden. Sound familiar? Next. Again, we have the whole Latin quote. The above extracts from the decree need no comment. It is remembered that these prohibitions and penalty were enacted by the last general council, which in, written in 1845 was the Council of Trent. The Roman Church, they have never been repealed. The Pope today, whenever any Pope takes the oath of being a Pope, he swears to uphold the Council of Trent today. Next. The fourth session was the most important one because in this fourth session, that's where they decreed that the Word of God was not the Word of God that I would believe, or most Bible believers, that being the the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek text of Tristeptus and the Byzantine text, they said the word of God is the Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Therefore, we have no common ground. Next. The fourth rule, the fourth congregation of the Index of Prohibited Books enacted by the fourth session of Council in Trent, uh, approved by Pope Pius VI in a bowl, issued on the 24th. Inasmuch as it is manifest from experience that if the Holy Bible translated into the vulgar tongue, be indiscriminately allowed to everyone, the temerity of men will cause more evil than good to arise from it. More evil is going to arise if we have the Bible in our own language. Yeah. And here, um, and he shall not receive absolution until he first deliver up the Bible. You can't read the Bible pursuant to the Council of Trent. Without the Bible, we have no Western civilization. We have no Constitution. Yes. This was taken from, uh, in 1820 to 29 from a fantastic book called The Jesuit Conspiracy written by Abate Le Leon. It's on my disc in the book. You can read the entire book. Dear brethren, the six assistants of the Jesuit general, our weapons are of quite different temper from those of the seizures of all ages, and it will not be difficult for us to maneuver as to render ourselves masters of all the powers already so much weakened. We fear no lack of soldiers, only let us apply ourselves to recruiting them from all ranks from all nations, drilling them into punctual service. But let us, by the same time, be vigilant that no one may suspect our designs. You well know that what we aim is at the empire of the world. Written in 1848, published all throughout Europe, and was one of the impetuses that caused the second French Revolution in 1848. Our Father General, as you know, governs Rome itself and the Popedom. We make war at our pleasure betwixt one prince and another, between a prince and his subjects, usurp dominion over cities and countries, fearing no discovery of our actions, since our commerce is chiefly with great men. We know every public secret and can in a singular way dispatch, kill, heretics and enemies of the Roman court. F. Doza. Aye, give me gold, plenty of gold, and then with such able heads and such resources as the church commands, I will undertake not only to master the whole world, but to reconstruct it in entirely. Remember the Reconstruction? The American Reconstruction? Now we're having a Reconstruction amongst the Islamic nations. Next. Successful in her assaults upon this country, she may put the world back again into the darkness of the Middle Ages. This, our country, has been used as the greatest tool of the papacy to create the new world order. When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. The Vatican has ruled our country, lock, stock, and barrel, at least since the days of Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, until they put that Freemason in office after they assassinated McKinley. Every war we've been in since, since the Spanish-American War has been a Vatican War. Everyone. We all think we're patriots. I'm going overseas to Germany. My buddies are going to Nam. All for the Pope. Early in January, uh, communism is an enemy. We are all against it. But we have another enemy also, older, shrewd, too also older, shrewder. It is Roman Catholicism and its bid for world power. In the United States, it is Spellmanism. Car Cardinal Francis Spellman was the most powerful churchman up to his day that ever lived in the United States. Spellman was FDR's intelligent liaison overseas. He carried all his intelligence messages. He worked intimately with the OSS and Wild Bill Donovan, and Wild Bill Donovan was Irish Roman Catholic, you guessed it, Knight of Moulton. St. Bartholomew's Massacre in 1572. This is when the Jesuits organized the attempt at annihilation of all the French Huguenots or the French Protestants 
first out of Paris and then out of, ultimately out of France with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Henry Garnett, the Jesuit who was one behind the gunpowder plot with 36 barrels of gunpowder in, uh, in England. He tried to, they tried to blow up the king and the parliament. It was discovered. Um, Guy Fawkes was put to death and this was the Jesuit behind it and here's what he said. Oh God, destroy this perfidious nation. Extirpate from the earth those who live in it to the end that we may joyfully enter into Jesus Christ, the Pope, because he claims to be Jesus Christ, the praises that are due unto him. This is the kind of fanaticism that a Jesuit of the fourth vow has. The death of Gustavus Adolphus at Lutzen, 1594 to 1632. He was known as the Snow King and the great Lutheran hero. And here's what he said as he died. Here he is dying, giving his last full measure for Protestant liberty, declaring to his killers, I am the King of Sweden, and thus I seal with my blood the religion and liberties of Germany. Our hero's modest life and noble death furthered the reformation that brought about the modern era with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Any historian will tell you that the modern era began in 1648. The Dark ages, ages ended and the modern era began then. That's when science flourishes and we begin to build civilization. Japan, this is the most horrible story. The Jesuits came into Japan, they sought to conquer Japan. After conquering Japan, they sought to conquer China. Well, the Japanese got wise to them. They, they suppressed them and expelled them in 1614. In 1622, they hung many Jesuit traders, and righteously so. Here's Matthew Rickey conquering China for the Pope in 1605 with IHS. They did not succeed. Next. We're going to jump 200 years in the future. We're going to look at these two men here. This is Albert Fall and this is Knight of Malta, Edward de Haney. Albert Fall was the Secretary of Interior. He made a secret deal with de Haney because de Haney was an oil man. And he would, de Edward de Haney was far richer than John D. Rockefeller. When was the last time we ever heard of Edward de Haney? Okay, this evil and calculating man bribed his old friend Albert Fall into leasing Navy oil land in Elk Hills, California, which oil netted him $100 million in gold. <clears throat> Dehaney then built Navy fuel storage tanks at Pearl Harbor in the name of national security. This is in the 20s, folks. When did the Japanese attack? 41. They're planning in the 20s for a Japanese attack. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And, and Dehaney talks about this Mongol invasion. <laughs> Fall was convicted of taking a bribe from Dehaney, but after four court battles, Papal Knight Edward Dehaney was found innocent of giving the very same sinister bribe that Fall had been sent to prison for receiving. <laughs> that shows how they control the courts. Now the Company of Jesus could incite a Japanese attack using FDR and Hirohito to wage war against the anti-Jesuit Japanese people. Hirohito and FDR worked together. I had an old missionary Japanese friend, Daniel Fuji. He said we couldn't stand Hirohito. They lie. He lied to us. Here's a Japanese trader. This is an admiral of the Japanese fleet that attacked Pearl Harbor. Having been ex ex exhorted by the orders of Emperor Hirohito and Admiral Isoro Yamamoto, educated at Harvard, that the fate of the Japanese Empire will depend on this issue of this battle, this shameless traitor refused to order a third airborne attack wave at Pearl Harbor, sparing essential targets including ship repair and fuel storage facilities. The harbors of above ground fuel tanks built by Knight of Malta Edward de Haney in preparation for the Pacific War were filled to capacity with 4.5 million barrels of oil, oil and remained untouched. According to Admiral Husband E. Kimmel, if the oil tanks had been destroyed, the Pacific Fleet would have been forced to wage a 4,000 mile war from the distant California coast as there was no fuel available anywhere else in the Pacific. The Battle of Midway would never have taken place during which the Japan lost half of its fleet. Since the purpose of the Black Post attack on Pearl Harbor was merely to incite 14th Amendment America to declare war on Japan, Nagumo's attack was never intended by the Japanese high command under Jesuit control to destroy the base. As a result, the fate of the Japanese Empire was sealed. Japanese treason, American treason, Dwight Eisenhower being the most disgusting American general traitor who probably ever drew a breath. <clears throat> Irish massacre, 1642, is when the Jesuits motivated the Irish to kill their own people. Next.
My Jesuit, ex-Jesuit advisor who taught me this one, I was shocked to hear it, and he wrote it himself. During this, uh, this is the second Irish massacre from 1845 to 1850. We're all taught it's the Irish potato famine, aren't we? What nonsense. During this five-year period that Queen with Queen Victoria sitting on the British throne, Jesuit controlled, the whole house of Hanover was Jesuit controlled since George III, the royal butcheress of Ireland who managed to raise her infamous son, Jack the Ripper, closely attended by her Jesuit advisors, advisors freighters laden with Irish meats, vegetables, etc., were departing Irish ports en route to other countries at the rate of about seven freighters per day. The Jesuits in control of Victoria were starving Ireland. In the night, <clears throat> while nearly one million of my Irish ancestors were starving to death, in the 1930s, the company would cause Stalin's massacre of the Orthodox Ukrainians and the so-called famine in the Ukraine, ordering Stalin to lock up all the food as millions perished. In addition to producing another Vatican harvest, the Irish Protestant body count, the ensuing increased Irish immigration provided the Jesuits with a stepped-up flow of Irish Catholics to the United States to help build within that Protestant nation a blindly obedient papal fifth column as an instrument for destroying American constitutional self-government. It worked. In the 1960s, the Jesuits would cause the forced mass immigration of North Vietnamese Catholics to South Vietnam by using Ho Chi Minh, who had a Catholic advisor as a bishop, a bishop advisor, to spread the rumor that his communists were going to kill all the Catholics in North Vietnam. The U.S. Navy, controlled by Cardinal Spellman's Francis Matthews, who was the head of the Knights of Columbus at the time, provided the vessels for that movement. Next. Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell that overcame the machinations of the Jesuit order and saved Protestant England. Next. Pierre Le Chase, the Jesuit confessor of King Louis XIV, who was the one behind the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. He, it had become evident that Louis XIV had, uh, had seduced his daughter-in-law, and in order for him to get forgiveness for that sin, he had to uh, revoke the Edict of Nantes, with, which granted well, uh, religious freedom in France, and so that is what he did. Next. Now we have the Jesuits torching the French Protestant Huguenots in 1785. Next. Now we have Jesuit ascendancy and power. They're getting more and more powerful. This is Rid Pass World, Rid, Rid Pass well, History of the World, uh, printed in 1898. You can't find this in any encyclopedia today. To know all secrets, fathom all designs, penetrate all intrigues, prevail in all councils, rise above, rise above all diplomacy, and master the human race, such was their purpose and ambition. They had all power over intelligence, and we shall see that includes today the FBI, which was started by Charles, Charles Bonaparte in 1906. Right, next. These are the Guarani reductions in Paraguay from 1600 to 1750. This is where the Jesuits perfected communism. Communism is not Jewish. Communism is not Zionistic. Communism is Jesuit. That's where they were perfected for 150 years. Next. On these reductions, universal equality prevailed. The principles of socialism or communism, very much now as understood, 1894, governed all the reductions. Now we know where the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment came from. The 13th Amendment is, remember the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity? 13th Amendment is liberty. 14th Amendment is equality. 15th Amendment, fraternity. And I'll also add that this Jesuit-controlled government didn't want to raise the blacks to the same level as the whites. But the 14th Amendment reversed the origin and character of American citizenship, made U.S. citizenship primary, state citizenship subordinate to that, and the privileges and immunities of this new 14th Amendment U.S. citizenship did not include the Bill of Rights. Slaughterhouse Cases, 1872. Next. Okay, <clears throat> we now have the Jesuits starting up Freemasonry, again, 1717, and the purpose of Freemasonry is that their principal desire was the restruction of the Temple of Solomon. The higher I went into the order, the Jesuit order, the more corruption I saw within the institution. I was invited to attend a secret black mass by high-ranking Jesuits in a monastery in northern part of Spain. When I knelt to kiss the ring of a high official, I saw a symbol on that ring that made my blood run cold. 
It was a Masonic symbol, a thing I hated, and I had been taught, uh, told to fight against it. I found out the Jesuit general was also a Mason and a member of the Communist Party in Spain, Alberto Rivera, probably the greatest living man of the last 50 years. The purpose of, the, of Freemasonry that the Jesuits revived to maintain the order's death grip over the Pope, the College of Cardinals, and thus the papacy. To destroy the Protestant Reformation while restoring and maintaining the temporal power of the order's infallible Pope over every nation. To gain possession of Jerusalem in order to rebuild Solomon's temple for the Pope, which after every Masonic lodge is patterned. Next. So the Jesuits have all this power. They revive Freemasonry. They're controlling the kings. They're the confessors of all the nations. They control all the money. Uh, they have universal power. But something happens. Toward the late 1700s, Portugal expels them, France expels them, and Spain expels them. The three primary Catholic powers in Europe, they all expel the Jesuits. They, in fact, the expulsion of the Jesuits from Spain would make a fantastic movie. So, as a result, the Pope suppresses the Jesuits in 1773 with a papal bull, not a papal brief, it's a papal bull. And when they suppress him, the Pope says, this suppression will be my death. Indeed, he was poisoned 14 months later with a terrible poison called a ketta, and a ketta can be given by the dose to determine how long you want that person to suffer and die. Okay, next. And here's the Honorable Pope Clement XIV, who had the courage enough and the guts enough to suppress the Jesuit order. Next. Here's the murdered Pope Paul, John Paul I, according to David Yallop in his In God's Name. And here's the, bla uh, the black Pope's Freemason, Jean Carnevale, who was the one responsible behind the murder, with his other Masonic brethren working for the Jesuit general, Pedro Rupe. Next. Here's a system of pap the papacy, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, priests, congregation, and the, pa and the system of Freemasonry. The sovereign grand commander, the grand inspection general, thrice illustrious grand commander, blah, blah, blah. It's all the same system, all the same religion, just two different manifestations of it. So why should we be surprised when we see them work together? Okay, never, in the, never before in the history of the world's history that such a society appeared. The old Roman Senate, Roman Senate itself did not lay schemes for world domination with any greater certainty of success than Hardenburg, 1800. Jesuit General Ricci. Jesuit General Ricci is the one who was the Jesuit of the suppression, the general of the suppression. He started the Illuminati with his Gentile German, Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt was not a Jew. He was a Gentile, a white Gentile. There are many, many Germans by the name of Weishaupt. Next. Frederick the Great protects the Jesuits during their suppression. And guess who he is? He's the head of all Freemasonry on the continent. So why should we be surprised to see the alignment between Freemasonry and the Jesuits? Next. There's a lot of those people that say, well, the Jews are behind the Jesuits. No, they're not. There's no Jews in the Jesuit order. There were, but in 1593, there was a statute that was passed that forbade them to be in it. The constitution of the Jesuit order contains six impediments against reception into the order, the first of which is Jewish descent to the fourth generation. And since 1593, general council of the order have many times proclaimed that Jewish descent must be considered as an impurity, a scandal, a dishonor, and infamy. Sarez, Francisco Sarez, noted Jesuit theologian, also states that Jewish descent is an impurity of such indelible character that it is sufficient to prevent admission into the order. No Jews in the Jesuit order. No Jews in the SS. Is there a relationship there? Sure, because Heinrich Himmler patterned the SS after the Jesuit order according to the Fuhrer himself. Next. And there's Weishaupt, that wonderful man. You all know of him. Okay, next. Next. George Washington. Yes, George Washington was a Mason in his early days, but according to his own words, he went to the Masonic Lodge once or twice during the last 30 years of his life. General Washington was a godly man, and he was baptized by a Baptist preacher by the name of John Gano. And the Lord used him to give him our country. If it wasn't for this man, we would have never successfully broken away from England with the help of Lafayette and Catholic France, who at the time, Catholic France had expelled the Jesuits. Okay. So France was to pay for that. 
Okay, Weishaupt and his fellow Jesuits cut off the income to the Vatican by launching leading the French Revolution, directing Napoleon's conquest of Catholic Europe, eventually having Napoleon throw Pius VII in jail at Avignon till he agreed as a price for his release the reestablishment of the Jesuit order. This Jesuit war in the Vatican was terminated by the Congress of Vienna by the secret treaty of 1822, Treaty of Verona. The French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars was payback for the Roman Catholic monarchs of Europe and the Pope suppressing the Jesuit order. Napoleon Bonaparte was a Roman Catholic Freemason. Robespierre was a Roman Catholic Freemason trained by Jesuits in the College of Clermont in France for nine years, eight or nine years. The French Revolution was orchestrated by the Jesuits. The Jesuits had been confined to Corsica when they came back from Spain, when they were shipped back to Spain. You know where Napoleon came from? Corsica. Corsica. He was their man. He was what was called a French, a very wealthy French lady said, a robust spear on horseback. He was no hero. And he was also a traitor. Here's Napoleon. After he has, has done his dirty work of conquering Europe, killing thousands of people, punishing the monarchs, punishing the Knights of Malta, driving the Knights of Malta from their island, confiscating all their weapons and treasures. He, uh, after he's done the duty of the Jesuits, here he is now abandoning his army of men, 250,000 to the snows of Russia. You men, how would you like to be in a war and your leader abandon you in snow? Would you like that? Okay. <clears throat> The Jesuits, upon the Pope being declared infallible in 1870, wished to take a step towards the accomplishment of their great object of establishing a universal monarchy with the white Pope nominally at the head and the black Pope holding the reins. This is how the papacy works. The Pope is merely a figurehead for the Jesuit general. He does what he's told, and if he doesn't, he's, it's curtains for him. The papacy obeys the Jesuit general and has since 1814. And that was written by a nun, uh, M.F. Cusack, who was a godly and brilliant nun, a Bible believer. It is with these insights we shall fully understand the 19th century leading into World War I. The Brotherhood will make great gains in its reentrance into Japan, its assassination of Japanese Emperor Komei at only 36 years of age, the overthrow via resignation of the Japanese Tokugawa Shogun, Japan's lifting the Christian ban, its destruction of America's Protestant and Baptist Calvinist Republic, and the Pope being declared to be infallible in 1870. The order would also experience great losses as the Pope losing his temporal power to the Catholic Italian patriots, as well as the expulsion from the German Empire in 1872 and from Republican Catholic France in 1880. The 19th century was a century of disaster again for the Jesuits in Europe. They're expelled by France in 1880 by that wonderful Gambetta. They're expelled by, from Germany with Bismarck and the Reichstag. That's why we had the Reichstag fire by the Reichstag uh, in 1872. And they're expelled by Italy. Um, and the Pope's temporal power is taken in 1870, and he would lose it until Benito Mussolini comes along and takes it back. Next. And here's this devil worshiping wizard, King George III. When I found that picture of him, I thought, wow, this fits. Okay, uh, this blind and deaf, most evil of English kings whose parliament established Roman Catholicism as a state religion for Quebec. Here's a supposed Protestant establishing this for, the, for Quebec, a British holding, and whose prime minister was the Jesuit Lord Shelbourne, secretly preserved the political and financial power of the Jesuit order. During this Jesuit suppression, the J, they were protected by George III. So our revolutionaries were fighting a Jesuit-controlled king at our Revolutionary War. Okay. As we shall see, Rome's present quest for an international fascist, socialist, communist police state is the same policy for the Jesuit General's Holy Alliance. That policy of no religious freedom and no political freedom has been continued by the Black Pope's international intelligence community. All the intelligence agencies, dear friends, all work together. Watch it as it unfolds in this war in the Middle East. The Mossad works with the CIA. The CIA works with the SVR now, it was the KGB. The BND, the ISI of Pakistan, MAC of Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, they all work together because they're all tied together at the top through Shriner Freemasonry and the Knights of Malta. 
Alexander, probably the greatest Russian czar who ever lived, he expelled the Jesuits in 1820 because they sought to keep the Bible from circulating in his country. As a result, they poisoned him, and the Jesuits would be expelled from Russia for over 100 years until remarkable things happened, like Lenin allowing the Jesuits to return in Russia in 1922. That tells you who's behind the Bolshevik Revolution. Okay. Next. Lafayette, the great Lafayette, one of my heroes. If the liberties of the United States of America are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. That ought to be enshrined and put in our, in our, at the White House. Next. Now we're going to see the relationship to IHS, the Freemasonry. In one old book I have, it's called Light on Masonry by, by a Baptist pastor. It says, to all this and every part thereof, I do now as before by the honor and power of the mark, as by an awful oath, solemnity, blind and ob obligate my soul, I become the silent and mute subject of the illustrious order. And for a breach of silence, I shall die the infamous death of a traitor, bearing testimony even in death of the power of the mark of the holy and illustrious cross before IHS. Our thrice illustrious counselor, could it be that the mark of the beast will be IHS? And again, they deal with it again. IHS is a, is, is a mark of Freemasonry. Okay, next. Here we have Napoleon the Little, another terrible individual. He, uh, he was put to power by the Jesuits with a coup d'etat, which uh, Queen Victoria applauded. He also was the one who started the Crimean War. He also got involved in Vietnam, which then we took over that. He also caused the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Next. Karl Marx, the Jewish Shriner Freemason. The Jesuits are going to start modern communism with the, with the Communist Manifesto, and knowing all the atrocities they're going to do, because communism is nothing more than the Inquisition under another name. So knowing what they're going to do, they're going to use this Jew, and then they're going to blame it on the Jews of the world. Why? Communism is Jewish. It's an international Jewish conspiracy. It's not an international Jewish conspiracy. The Zionists are involved. It's an international Jesuit conspiracy. And the Jesuits are the biggest socialists you ever want to talk to. And yet they command the greatest fortunes in the world. The Jesuits own the Bank of America, the first or second largest bank in the world, second to the Federal Reserve Bank. <clears throat> By this time, the Jesuits are busy conspiring against our nation, and Samuel Morse makes this very clear. He talks about the conspiracy against the liberties of this republic, and this was in the 1830s. The Church of Rome has a design upon that country, and it will in time be the established religion, I will aid, and it will aid in the destruction of that republic. I have conversed with the many of the sovereigns and princes of Europe, and they have unanimously expressed these opinions relative to the government of the United States and their determination to subvert it. Again, this was written in early 1820s. And then the priests themselves were determined to take possession of the United States, and this was exposed by the great Charles Chenequi. If you haven't ever read his 50 years in the Church of Rome, it is an absolute must reading, and it should be part of your library. Chenequi then says, from that, the Catholic priests, with the most admirable ability and success, have gathered their Irish legions in the great cities of the United States. And the American people must be very blind indeed if they do not see that if they do nothing to prevent it, the day is very near when the Jesuits will rule their country from the magnificent White House at Washington to the humblest civil and military department of this vast republic. The Jews don't run this country. The Protestants don't run this country. It's the Irish Roman Catholics that run this country. They run the banks. The most powerful, I'll get to this here, the Federal Reserve Bank, the, the New York Bank, is run by William J. McDonough, who's a Jesuit-trained economist and member of the CFR. Dear Truth Seeker, by 1963, the rich Irish Catholics would be the power brokers of 14th Amendment America, and Dr. J. Peter Grace, who was, who was the godfather of Pat Robertson's children. And if we'll get on Pat Robertson a little more. His good buddy, Jeremiah Denton, who, who wrote When Hell Was in Session, Knight of Malta. Um, Knights of Malta, Joseph P. P. Kennedy, friend of billionaire Knight of Malta, Aristotle Onassis, the big shipper. 
would be supreme in power, business and entertainment, and Francis Spellman would be the greatest art bishop in history. All these guys are Irish Catholic, except Onassis. Today, Cardinal Egan has replaced Spellman. William J. Flynn has replaced Grace. William J. McDonough leads the Federal Reserve in New York. And CFR member Joseph O'Hare with Leo J. O'Donovan are the empire's two most powerful professed Jesuits of the Fourth Vow, being the presidents of Fordham and Georgetown. And by the way, Joseph O'Hare is the advisor of Mary Robinson. And Mary Robinson is the one who cried out about the Jenin hoax, blaming the Jews for this, for this massacre in Jenin that did not take place. And her master was Joseph O'Hare, the Jesuit president of Fordham. So we have now the beginning of the creation of worldwide international anti-Jewish fury by the Jesuits. Next. And here we have the Kennedys and Joe Kennedy with his master, Pius XII. Knight of Malta, one of the original founders of Hollywood. And Paramount Pictures. Okay, next. Albert Pike, isn't he a lovely fellow? I just love that hairdo. Luciferian, head of the first founder of the, of the Ku Klux Klan, 1866. And by the way, the only black leader I have any respect for is Malcolm X. You know why? Because Malcolm X said, the Ku Klux Klan and the Nation of Islam have the same paymasters. And for that, they put him to death. And according to his wife, it was the high command of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, with the high command of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, and Louis Farrakhan, all Masons of the Prince Hall Rite. And the Nation of Islam has nothing to do with Islam. They're fakes. It's just a hate the white man religion. And the Sunni Muslims have made it very clear that, is, that the Wahhabism, which I'll deal with a little bit, and Farrakhanism are heresies dangerous to American Muslims. Next. The great Benito Pablo Juarez. He's the greatest Mexican who probably ever lived. This full-blooded native Zapotec Indian is Mexico's greatest patriot, Civil War commander, and finest statesman of integrity ability and undying determination in his quest to make his beloved country a nation among nations. Having studied for the priesthood, he was, as a young man, he became the most dreaded enemy of the Society of Jesus while hating the temporal power of the papal Caesar in Rome. He exiled the Archbishop of Mexico along with five bishops, confiscated all the Pope's church property, composing the finest lands of the nation, expelled the Spanish ambassador, and hated Prince Metternich's holy alliance. He enforced the liberal constitution of 1857, securing the Protestant rights of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, utterly condemned by the Black Pope's Council of Trent. He sought to establish a middle class and repudiated the national debt. In 1867, he rightly executed Mexico's usurper and tyrant, Ferdinand Maximilian of the Order's House of Habsburg, sent by Francis Napoleon III, further outraging the Jesuits. For refusing to uphold the Pope's temporal power, so Juarez became a rebel king and therefore a tyrant, according to the satanic doctrines of the Spanish Jesuit Francisco Sarez. In 1872, he died at his desk, the victim of the poison cup. <clears throat> this is the reversal of American citizenship. The 14th Amendment caused U.S. citizenship to become paramount and dominant and state citizenship subordinate and derivative. Who says? Selective draft law cases, 245 upholding slaughterhouse cases. Next. Okay. One of the most wicked men who ever drew a breath in our country. He's the master of the 14th Amendment, the evil, evil Thaddeus Stevens, who was the utter dictator in the House of, of uh, rep, uh, 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 the Representatives. He was called a traitor by President Johnson while he destroyed the government of the old union, changed his form and spirit, and made a new union with new theories and powers. Horace Greeley, one of Stephen's masters, adds, we have brought all laborers to a common level by reducing the whole working population, white and black, to a condition of serfdom. It reduced us all to the same level. Just like C.S. Lewis said, we've got to cut them all down to the same level of ciphers. There can be no great men. Okay, next. Here is John Surratt, who at 23 or 21 masterminded and carried out the assassination of Lincoln. Here he is arrested in 1867 in the Pope's Zouave Army. And notice the fez. Ever seen a fez before? 
Notice where that occurs also? Masonry, the Shriners. Here's Surat in 1916, lived to be an old man. He was a hero for, in the eyes of the papers for carrying out that assassination. Next slide. About this time, in 1864, Pope Pius IX condemns in his uh, syllabus of errors, of 80 errors of, Western, of civilization, here are a few of them, reprobated, forbidden, and condemned is the proposition by the exercise of any religion whatsoever, men may find the way to eternal salvation and attain eternal happiness. In other words, you don't have a right to choose to believe what you want to believe. Uh, finally, there is a proposition, the Pope of Rome must conform and accommodate himself to progress, to liberalism and modern civilization, which is reprobated, forbidden, and condemned. Now, we're going back to the Dark Ages if it's up to the Pope. Next. Bismarck. The great Otto von Bismarck was the one who, with the Reichstag, expelled the Jesuits from the German Empire. Germany would pay dearly for this with a second 30 years war from 1914 to 1945. Victor Emmanuel, first king of Italy, took the temple power from the pope. The pope locked himself up in the Vatican, declared himself a prisoner because he didn't have any more temple power. Victor Emmanuel still remained a Catholic and he said, Pius IX, you can still be my spiritual head, but you don't have temple power. I'm the king of Italy. For that, the pope excommunicated him, cursing every part of his body. I have the curse in my book. Don't read it. Next. The great Michael Leon Gambetta, a Frenchman, he was prime minister of France, France's first orator. France had expelled the Jesuits, and for their expulsion, which he was a part of, he was shot by accident by his mistress assassin. It's interesting, it's always by accident. <laughs> Next. Okay, the Jesuits at the time of, in the 19th century, late 19th century, they have this disaster in Europe. Where do they go? They go to England and America. The two greatest Protestant citadels of freedom and faith in the world, the Jesuits make that their kingdom. And it's from there that they will launch out and cause their second 30 years war. If there was a land in which work was to be done and perhaps much safer, much to suffer, it is here, England, where it heresy conquered in England, it would be conquered throughout the world. All its lines meet here, and therefore in England, the Church of God, Rome, must be gathered in all its strength. Henry Cardinal Manning. Remember, the Jesuits have controlled England since 1800, and they've controlled our country since 1900. Next. The great idea of the Jesuit has always been a universal spiritual and temporal monarchy in which the Jesuits should reign supreme. England has always been the place desired for, those, for the base of operations necessary to this end. Hence the blood, the tears shed, and the schemes undertaken in this country by the Jesuit. He has by no means ended his efforts for the subjugation of the world to Rome through England. Does that sound familiar? Everything you read about England and the, the British monarchy is true, but she is subordinate to the Jesuit general. In fact, when she goes to Stonyhurst, she curtsies to the Jesuits there. And Stonyhurst is really the capital of England, just like Georgetown is the capital of America. Today, they are strong in the United States than they ever were in any of the countries in Europe in which expelled them as a menace to the government, 1912. Our hero, Jeremiah Crowley, born again, Bible-believing man who was an Irish priest. Next. Victoria. Again, we are at a loss in describing this most careless of European monarchs. Deceptively portrayed as an enemy by, of Rome by the English Cardinal Wiseman, Queen Victoria, like George III, was completely in the hands of the militia of the Black Pope. During the British century, 1900s or the 1800s, her prime ministers, Vis Viscount Palmerston and, and Benjamin Disraeli, used the diplomatic and military might of Protestant England to restore and maintain the temple power of the papal Caesar around the world. London never came to the aid of struggling peoples as they resisted the continental tyrants enforcing the Jesuits' holy alliance, but rather secretly opposed their efforts. England refused to give asylum to the Italian patriots when they fl fled the British Malta in 1849, conducted the opium wars against the orders hated Chinese Manchu dynasty. Why did the Jesuits hate the Manchus? Because the Manchus kicked them out. So they used England to wage that opium war against them. 
conducted, um, approved of the Jesuits' coup d'etat of Napoleon III's French Empire in 1852, sided with the Jesuits' Crimean War against Orthodox Russia in 1856, fired the American anti-slavery agitation. Of course, slavery, the Federal Congress had no power over slavery. It was a domestic institution, causing the merciless annihilation of our white Southern Protestant culture and the war between the states and the pro-Negro reconstruction from 1861 to 1876 invaded the liberal Mexican Republic of our hero Benito Pablo Juarez in 1864. This depraved and selfish woman was the epitome of treason against the risen Son of God. Terrible person. <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt, he was her brother. <laughs> they worked hand in hand. Next. It was important that the Jesuit win the Bolshevik Revolution. Benedict XV, who an ex-Jesuit Pius XI, advised by his Jesuit confessors, began discreetly to negotiate with the Bolsheviks. Cardinal Gasperi, the Secretary of State, had warned that the victory of Orthodox Tsarist Russia, to whom France and England had made so many promises, would be for the Vatican a disaster greater than the Reformation. The Jesuits were behind the Bolshevik Revolution. That's why they reinstituted and brought in the Jesuits. And that's why they trained, they changed from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And the Gregorian calendar was devised by a Jesuit, Christopher Clavius. Next. This is very important. The Jews, again, did not wrote the write the protocols. The protocols were written by the Jesuits at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. And this is according to the great Leo Lehman, who was an Irish priest, who later was converted to Christ, as I mentioned, started missionary to Catholics in New York. This Leo, Leo Lehman conducted a court proceeding on behalf of American priests and bishops in the Pope's court called the Sacred Rota, and he conducted this, uh, this, pro this process against the Jesuits. Leo Lehman knew the Jesuits like the back of his hand. Here's what he said. Although first published in Russia in 1903, the Protocols of Zion had their origin in France and date from the Dreyfus Affair, of which the Jesuits were the chief instigators. Yes, the chief of the general staff, his confessor was a Jesuit of the Dreyfus Affair. These protocols of supposedly Jewish leaders are not the first documents of their kind fabricated by the Jesuits. For over a hundred years before these protocols appeared, the Jesuits had continued to make use of a similar fraud called the Secrets of the Elders of Borgfontein. The Secrets of the Elders of Borgfontein against Jansenism, an anti-Jesuit French Catholic movement among the secular clergy. Yeah, those Catholics, were, they were Bible believers. They believed the Bible to be the final authority of faith and practice, so the Jesuits hated them. They had a bull passed against the Jansenists. But they put out the secrets of the elders of the Borg Fontaine prior to the protocols. Next. The French Revolution and the Russian Revolutions are identical. Therefore, the authors are the same. Both revolutions were based on communist writings of Freemasons. Both revolutions plundered the state churches. Both revolutions ended the monarchies. Both revolutions produced Jesuit republics. Both revolutions declared atheism as a religion of the state. Both revolutions carried out a reign of terror by an inquisitional secret police. They were all both identical. In fact, if, when, you, when there was still the Iron Curtain, if you went into East Germany, they had a big museum up to communism and said that it started with the French Revolution. 1789. Next. Okay, the Bolshevik revolutions take place. The Bolsheviks are in power. The instruments of this new alliance between the Soviets and the Vatican were to be the Jesuits. This is out of priest James Zadko's great work, The Set in the Darkness, 1965. Reportedly, there were and had been for a considerable time large numbers of representatives of the Jesuit order in Moscow including Bishop Edward Rupp. Okay, so the Jesuits were working in conjunction with their Bolshevik servants and the papacy. And I believe they set up a secret concordat, and that's why we have all this mass murder of the Russian Orthodox people. Next. This is a very important man right there. You never hear a word about him, and it's hard to find his picture. This man is Nicholas Brady, Knight of Malta, and get this, he rose to become owner, director, or chairman of over 100 corporations, including Chrysler Corporation, Brooklyn Subway, National City Bank, and Anaconda Copper. National City Bank is one of the holders of the Federal Reserve. 
And Chrysler, do you know any other Knight of Malta that's been head of the Chrysler in the past? Lee Iacocca. The agent in the Kennedy assassin who tells the driver, who tells Carl Renas to drive the bullet uh, shot up limousine back to Ohio to get it repaired. It was Iacocca that he dispatched his chief of security of the Dearborn Division of Ford Motor Company. Next. We have here Edmund Walsh. He conducted this quote unquote relief mission into Russia. And it is here that this man installed Joseph Stalin as the secretary of the Communist Party. And Joseph Stalin, remember, had been trained by Jesuits at Tiflis Seminary. And the overseer of Joseph Stalin became Cardinal Agagnian, who also was the head of the KGB and had also been educated at Tiflis Seminary in Georgia, just outside of Russia. Next. Next. Armand Hammer, one another wonderful man. Here is another Masonic Jewish Zionist. Remember the Council on Foreign Relations? Hammer, a traitor to his own Jewish race, built major industries within communist Russia. For a time, all trade between the United States and Soviet Russia passed through his hands. Working with the Jesuits, Irish, Episcopalian, and Roman Catholic Henry Ford, who circulated the Jew-hating protocols, and whose son, Henry Ford II, formerly converted to Catholicism, married in the McDonald family, like McDonald Douglas. That's an Irish Catholic, not a Malta family builds all our fighter aircraft. Ford some tractors were brought into Russia as early as 1923. Ford. So as the head of Occidental Petroleum, he freely entered and exited the Black Polish Russian police state whenever he wished. He greatly contributed to the Jesuit authored illusion that international communism was Jewish, making Bernard Stemfel's Mein Kampf believable, justifying Hitler's final solution. This is what the Jesuits did. They used all these uh, notorious uh, Yiddish Jewish Zionists in the revolution. They blamed the Bolshevik Revolution on them. That turned around, fired Europe up against the Jews in Russia, and that was a basis for Operation Barbarossa and the invasion into Russia with the Einstein group and killing the Jews in Russia. So the Jesuits used the Jews to justify killing the low common man Jew in Russia. Brilliant scheme. Next. When I found this picture, I almost passed out. It was, it's an Anthony K. Brown's uh, Wild Bill Donovan's The Last Hero. Here's Donovan, the head of the CIA, uh, going into the Vatican, getting the highest award the Pope can give to him for a lifetime, for a lifetime of secret intelligence services to the Vatican. So why should we be surprised to see the CIA working for the Vatican when a man by the name of Vince Canestrero, who was in the CIA, is now the chief of Vatican security at this moment? Okay. He was also not a mole. This is. Anybody remember Jesuit uh, uh, General Sherman of the South? Remember how he plundered and destroyed the place? He plundered the Protestant South. That was all Protestant white folks from, from Atlanta to Savannah that he killed, raped, pillaged, and plundered. His son, Thomas Sherman, became one of America's most powerful Jesuits. Next. Here we have Lucky Luciano, and he was lucky. Isn't he a nice guy? He's really smiling. <laughs> this head of the Mafia Commission in New York was in prison, and supposedly he helped secure a successful invasion of Sicily, for which reason Cardinal Spellman got him released and deported back to Sicily in 1946. Do you see how Cardinal Spellman controlled the most powerful Mafia don of his day? So why should we be surprised to see mafiosos like Jack Ruby and James Files, the shooter on the grassy knoll, all mafiosos, working with the Secret Service, the CIA, and the FBI, all working together? Next. My Lord, see my Lord from this room. From this room I govern not only Paris, but China. Not only China, but the whole world without anyone knowing how it is managed. This is intelligence. We're going to get to the establishment of the FBI in 1908. Next. And here's that lovely Masonic papal knight, Charles Joseph Bonaparte, who is directly related to Napoleon and also Napoleon III. This is the man that starts the FBI. Um, they were concerned, they called it the bureaucratic bastard. The FBI, the bureaucratic bastard. That's what the congressman called it. We'd become a spy system of espionage conducted by the national government to dig up the private scandals of men. 
The resultant FBI has become exactly that. Even worse, the, I call it the order of the FBI, like the order of the Jesuits. <laughs> it's nothing more than an extension of the papal seizures, holy office of the Inquisition with all the powers of Hitler's Gestapo and Stalin's NKVD. It was perfected under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover. Okay. And here are these two mutual homosexuals uh, <laughs> uh, making a date. Okay, and uh, so here's homosexual Spellman and uh, uh, Hoover working together. Now it's interesting, Hoover recruiting from the Jesuit institutions of Georgetown, Fordham, and Marquette universities, many Irish and Italian Roman Catholics filled the ranks of Hoover's Federal Bureau of Investigation, including Ray Abbott-Shito and his nephew, G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon Liddy was, was recruited from Fordham, okay? But F Liddy would not think on Nixon. And for that, the order's most reversed federal judge, John J. Sirica, put Liddy in jail for 20 years. We're going to punish you, G. Gordon, because you're not going to go along with the program. And I admire Gordon for that. He didn't talk. He, eight years later, he was released. This Hoover Spellman CFR press lord, Henry R. Luce, intrepidly mesmerized the mind and duped the American public in carrying out the black pope's anti-communist agitation. Remember, the Jesuits are in control of communism. So they get us going, anti-communism, anti-communism, anti-cosm, while they're busy destroying our liberty. Never a, d a true blow ever being dealt to communism. Next. Now we're going to deal with the Titanic, when the Jesuits sunk the Titanic. By the command of God, it is lawful to murder the innocent, to rob, and to commit all lewdness, because the Pope is Lord of life and death and all things, and thus to fulfill his mandate is our duty. The Jesuits sunk the Titanic because of John Jacob Astor and his relationship with, with um, the Louis Brandeis, who was a Supreme Court Justice, because they were both against the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank. No, um, uh, Brandeis was not, but uh, Astor was. I'll show you here. Next. How'd they sink it? I believe they hit an iceberg. I believe that they did hit an iceberg. They sailed into this 80 square mile iceberg field. They hit it at 22 knots. And when they hit it, the, the, the captain swung, uh, his first mate swung the wheel to, put, to hold the broadside of the ship into the iceberg. That's what he tried to do. They set out to destroy the Titanic. And it already had a fire going from the time it had left uh, Queenstown, Ireland. Now look what we have here. Hollywood actor Martin Sheen's summer visit at Pennsylvania's Jesuit Center for Spiritual Growth. Here we have, here's a Jesuit, and here's a Jesuit, and here's a Jesuit coadjutor, Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen narrates the, specific, the very wonderful sequence of the Titanic, where I found out it was the Jesuits that were very much involved in taking the pictures of all the people that were on the Titanic before it sunk. Now let's take a look at the Jesuit who boarded the ship and took all the pictures. Next. John Jacob Astor. High-level Freemason, Jewish Freemason, the richest man in the world, he was the target. And yes, he went down and they found him. His wife survived. Next. Francis M. Brown. This was the most powerful man in Ireland. And the Irish province of the Society of Jesus includes Australia. This man boarded the Titanic, spent a day and a night on it, took all the pictures of the doomed passengers, and right before it departs out of Ireland, he, the lucky priest, in the words of Martin Sheen on Secrets of the Titanic, disembarks. Okay. And the financier of the Titanic is a Shriner Freemason and the Pope's money man in the United States, J.P. Morgan. So this Shriner Freemason, he owned the White Star Line, he's on the White Star Pier right there in 1912. And they went on to create the Federal Reserve Bank. With the Federal Reserve Bank created, they now can begin the Second Thirty Years' War because that's how they pay for it. No Federal Reserve Bank, no Second Thirty Years', 30, second 30 years War. Isn't he a lovely man? I mean, doesn't he look like the rat that he is? <laughs> this is the Jesuit general, Count Vladimir Hoffman Ledochowski. This is the Black Pope. The rat, the mastermind, the military commander of the order's 20th century international vengeance called here in the Second Thirty Years' War, waged from 1914 to 1945. 
including the Mexican Civil War. I never heard of the Mexican Civil War until a year ago. A million Mexicans died. Um, World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Spanish Civil War. Yes, the Spanish Civil War with Francisco Franco, all carried out by the Jesuits. And this is a very important lesson. I may not have time to get to it. But the invasion of Spain, Spain, those Roman Catholic Basques wanted to throw off all the power of the Jesuits. So with their republic in the early 30s, they did. As a result, all those, uh, the, the Pope declared war upon them, and you know what he did to them? He called his Wahhabi Islamic leaders, because the Wahhabi Muslims are like the Jesuits of Catholicism. The Wahhabi Muslims that were started in the 1700s, and now the House of Saud is the Wahhabi champion. Saudi Arabia is Wahhabi neo-Islam, condemned by all the Sunni Muslims. Those Wahhabi Muslims were called and used by Franco to invade Spain. And you know who they were led by, those Muslims? Cardinal Segura, a Roman Catholic cardinal. Here we see the Jesuits using their Islamic assassins in the invasion of Spain. I tell you, this is a preview for us. Okay. Now we have the second 30 years war with all these things that begin to happen. I believe I'm going to have to, to um, cover a couple more things here. A high point, Knight of Malta, Joe Kennedy brings FDR to power. Knight of Malta, Franz von Papen brings Hitler to power. Hitler, Himmler, and the Jesuits. Next. Here are the, all these generals that the Jesuits killed because they got in the way. Admiral Canaris wanted to surrender, surrender Germany prematurely. That Erwin Rommel, he knew the invasion was going to be at Normandy. They called him back. SS killed him. Reinhard Heydrich, the blonde homosexual beast. What was his problem? He wanted to win. He's not playing the game. Heinrich Himmler. Heinrich Himmler wanted to surrender the Third Reich uh, at the end of the war. For, and for which reason Himmler, Hitler stripped him of all of his power, ordered him to be shot. And so Himmler escapes out of the frying pan into the fire to Britain. And of course, that's the end of Himmler. Meanwhile, Sir Stuart Menzies, who's Knight of Malta, head of the British SIS, he takes in Walter Schellenberg after the end of the war, head of the SD. So last is uh, General Henry Vlasov, a great Russian general who wanted to unite uh, with American troops to overthrow Stalin. He was taken back and murdered in the Lubyanka. And then General Yamamoto in 1943 wanted to surrender Japan. So, so Doolittle shot him out of the sky on orders of the Jesuit general. Next. And General Patton? General Patton wanted to march on Russia. So Patton was on a contract for $10,000 <coughs> given by... Knight of Malta, Wild Bill Donovan, he was poisoned in the hospital because he was recovering from his accident. Well, the Knights of Malta, the OSS, murdered Patton. The SS murders Canaris. The NKVD murders Vlasov. The Mossad murders Rabin. It's all the intelligence agencies keeping the men in political power and in military power in place. You get out of place, you're history. You've got to play the game, unless you know the Son of God. Okay, they want, to they want to reunite Germany into a new Holy Roman Empire. That's exactly what they're doing now. Next. This is very important. The Jesuits, in their own house organ, Civilta Catholica, Catholic civilization, have said, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Never forget it. Whenever you have a fascist government, you know the Jesuits are behind it, someplace, somewhere. Next. The third, and here's what von Papen said, the Knight of Malta that entered into the con concordat with Hitler, for Hitler, with the Pope. The Third Reich is the first power which not only recognizes, but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy. Knight of Malta, von Papen said this. By the way, von Papen was released at the Nuremberg trials. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't get, he doesn't get executed like he ought to be. OK, we have this crusade in Europe, and all these guys are working together. Next.
And this is the issue on patent. I just covered it. Okay, next. Killed with cyanide. Now, Franco proclaims Hitler's death. Of course, we, knew, we all know he escaped to South America. Upon Hitler's death, faked by the SS and funeral, the Fuhrer being honored with a solemn high requiem mass, just like John Surratt was honored on his death with a solemn high requiem mass. That's where three priests uh, carry out the funeral. That's only done for special per persons, okay? Hitler gets a high requiem mass. Approved by Pius XII for a job well done, he subsequently escaped through the Vatican rat lines. And then he says, Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, has died defending Christianity, really Romanism. It is understandable that our pen cannot find words with which to deplore his death when it was able to find so many to extol his life. Hitler died a Catholic. He was never excommunicated for what he did. That tells you about Pius XII and his Nazi Jesuit-controlled SS. Here's Spellman and FDR, his servant. FDR is, is in control of Spellman. Here is Joe Kennedy and Shriner Freemason, FDR. So he, there they have the Knights of Malta, Shriner Freemasons working together in the Dirty Deal, the Socialist Communist New Deal, where we got our socialist insecurity numbers. Okay. <laughs> this here, and uh, I don't know how much longer I have, but just let me know when we're ready to stop. A half an hour? About a half an hour? Oh, good. Okay, <clears throat> I believe, because I, I'm going to take some academic liberty here, okay, I believe that evidence points that nuclear bombs were not dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I believe those detonations took place on the ground and that fat man and little boy, when they were dropped, were flash bombs indicating to the Jesuits on the ground to throw the switch and blow the devices. My ex-Jesuit um, gentleman has done a little research on this, and he has shown the, geogra the geography of the place that uh, Arupe had, was head of the rector of a novitiate in between Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So he was in a perfect position to set up all the devices. <coughs> the other thing is the Rosenbergs, of course we're going to blame the Jews for giving the Russians nuclear secrets, aren't we? The Rosenbergs never did it. According to James Roosevelt in his A Family Matter, his father, Franklin Roosevelt, as president, gave the nuclear device to Joseph Stalin, and get this, 1943. 1943. They give all the nuclear devices to Stalin, goes up to Alaska, comes down through Russia, they ferry it across the channel into Japan, they build these devices probably over a series of months, and then when the time arrives, they detonate these devices because Japan was ready to surrender. They didn't need to blow these devices. They have to create their fear terror weapon to justify the Cold War. Because after all, isn't Bush and Putin talking about reducing the nuclear arsenal? Doesn't that get thrown in our face every time we turn on the TV? It's the nuclear war hoax that is the foundation of the Cold War. The other thing is, if you think about it, the first supposed detonation or public detonation of a nuclear device was on July 16th, 1945, in Alamogordo, the Trinity testing. You know how many days later fat, uh, the, uh, Naga Hiroshima was bombed? August 6th? 20 days. Are you telling me that from the first time a nuclear device has ever blown because there were no air bursts before that. No air bursts had ever taken place. The first time this nuclear device is detonated, in, in 20 days they're going to build two bombs, they're going to put all these components in there, and then they're going to put it on a ship to Indianapolis, and then they're going to send it over to Tinian, then they're going to fly it over with no Japanese resistance, of course, because the Jesuit general made sure that these dummies that were dropped weren't going to have any interception by Japanese fighters, because we've got to pull this off. You tell me that happened in 20 days? If any of you guys have been in the military, do they work fast? <laughs> huh? 20 days. I don't believe it. They may have dropped the bombs, but all the indications that I can see, no, they didn't do it. And so they created this hoax for, on the basis of the Cold War. And Japan got to suffer for it. It was therefore the Jesuit general who would issue the orders as to when, where, and how severely to incinerate the people of Japan 
with the hellfire of atomic blasts. Unnecessarily, I might add. Next. Again, this is more than what I've said. I have handouts on this if you'd like to have it. Next. For this reason, the selection of the two cities at such close proximity to the Jesuit novitiate was to have a single redundancy backup and for proper construction, management, and control purposes, including the coordination of the time triggering the atomic blast with the time of the dropping of a harmless dummy, I say flash bomb, the V-29. The risk of the accidental destruction of Jesuit Arupi along with his Jesuit novitiate as the possible result of B-29 bombing error was non-existent since the B-29 was only delivering a dummy, probably rigged with a, a charge. B-29 played the role of a patsy, the Lee Harvey Oswald of the atomic attack. The people of Japan would now have a reason to hate America with an eternal <coughs> hatred. This would be useful in future years for the eventual planned invasion of America. To ensure the B-29 patsies survived to reach their destinations, Jesuit Arupi was thoughtful enough to order the suspension of all Japanese military action in the skies over Japan. No patsy, no detonation. Following the successful detonation in Hiroshima, Jesuit Pedro Arupi quickly opened his novitiate to provide an emergency station with beds for the sick and dying survivors of the inferno that was the work of his own hands. Now this must have endeared him and his co-conspirators to his grateful and unsuspecting, agonizing victims. Anticipating the benefit of such a public relations windfall, Father Arupi must surely have stocked up on the... Next. On the first aid and medical supplies comfortably advanced uh, in advance of August 6, 1945, the day when he would personally transform Hiroshima into hell on earth. You know what I think, my dear friends? I think nuclear devices have already been placed in this country. I think they're rigged and they're ready to detonate whenever the CIA wants to do it. Because it's not Osama bin Laden that's doing it. It's going to be our own intelligence community that's going to do it, working for the Archbishop Egan of New York, who's subject to the Pope, who's subject to the Jesuit general. Now, according to Henry Gonzalez, he has proven that nuclear devices have been given to Saddam Hussein. So now, Saddam Hussein, when we attack Iraq, and these things get detonated in maybe Los Angeles or Philadelphia or wherever they might want to do it, now, what do you think the American people are going to do once they detonate these devices? They're all going to storm into the military and we're going to go fight that Iraq and a war in Iraq, right? Isn't that what you do? That's how they're going to use it. This whole thing of 9-11 is everything's back to normal. Nobody really cares anymore. It's back to work as usual. They're going to do something else. And if you read this week Newsweeks on George Bush, the article, it says the CIA is warning of a possible low-release nuclear detonation. Jean Baptist Jansen. Jean Baptist Jansen was the general of the Cold War. He was the one who gave the order to assassinate President Kennedy. Next. <clears throat> we have the Jesuit general involved in international drug trade. The international drug trade carried out by the mafia and the CIA is orchestrated by the Jesuit general. That is his trade, and he uses that to finance his international terrorist network because all the terrorist networks can work together. PLO, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, uh, you name it, they all work together. And what banks have they been using? Why, we have one of them's Chemical Bank, and the other's Chase Manhattan, run by the Knights of Malta, stock A class holders, stock class A, class A holders of the Federal Reserve. Okay, next. Here's a, an interesting name, <coughs> William E. Simon. Doesn't he have a son that's running for governor out here? Doesn't he? William E. Simon was the man who helped get the uh, loan for Lee Iacocca and Chrysler to continue build Chrysler in the huge uh, military industrial complex. William E. Simon's a knight of Malta. And I would imagine his son is also. So whoever you get here in California, you're going to get the son of a knight of Malta, William E. Simon's son, or you're going to get Gray Davis. You know what Gray Davis is? Knight of Columbus. Knight of Columbus, fourth vow, takes pretty much the same oath that the Jesuits do of the fourth vow. Two wonderful fellows. 
course, I can't talk because from my state, I have good old uh, Tom Ridge, the Office of Homeland Security, another papal knight, the, the new Himmler. <laughs> There's Spellman, Diem, and Henry Luce. Diem was Spellman's inquisitor in Vietnam. Kennedy approved of his execution. Spellman was furious. Three weeks later, Kennedy was dead. Next. This is a very telling photo, folks. Here he is, General Abrams being advised by Father Hawk, Dan Lyons, for the bombing of Hanoi, the mining of Haiphong Harbor. The men who ran that war were the Jesuits. He advised both Westmoreland and Abrams. Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro was trained by Jesuits for seven years. He is a Jesuit. Cuba is his Jesuit kindergarten. That's the epitome of communism. And look at the connection with Castro and Moscow. Why then the Jesuits run Moscow as well? In fact, the Jesuits trained Yasser Arafat in the early 50s to be their terrorist. Because Yasser Arafat would work in conjunction with the Mossad. Because Arafat smokes out the truly Islamic leaders that might truly damage the Pope Zionistic government of Israel, while at the same time they're going to kill Jewish people, which is what the Jesuits love. And then when these Masa Islamic leaders come out, then the Mossad picks them up, further securing the government of the Pope Zionist Israel. And when I talk like this, I'm distinguishing between the Lord's beloved Jewish people and the evil, wicked Zionist movement or uh, government controlled by the Jesuit general. Next. This is the man that oversaw the assassination in Dallas, Thomas Kylie Gorman. Controlled the police department and the mayor. Next. Knight of Malta, answerable to Cardinal Spellman. Here we have the Jesuits starting the Negro agitation in the 30s. They started this agitation. In the meantime, they started the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is all Masonic, all controlled by the Jesuit general, and certain notorious Masons involved with it, like Louis Farrakhan, and friends like the Reverend Jesse Jackson. All Freemasons of the Prince Hall Wright. Their whole purpose for the Nation of Islam is to start a race war in the United States in the major cities. That's why the CIA and the Mafia are bringing weapons and guns and ammunition to the large black communities in Los Angeles and other cities. The Jesuits are behind this. And I have a few friends in the Nation of Islam who realize this, and one of them is going to tell. This guy went to a, min a meeting of uh, Minister Farrakhan, and for 12 times he tried to interrupt him, ask him about the Jesuit order, and Farrakhan wouldn't answer him. Okay, next. All the assassins of Kennedy. Spellman, who oversaw it, Claire Booth Luce, J. Peter Grace, Dean Rusk, and Henry Luce. They are the ones who did it. Next. All Knights of Malta, and Claire Booth Luce is a dame of Malta. William F. Buckley, he's in on it. And he still lives. Next. The good old evangelical Christian Charles W. Colson and E. Howard Hunt, both in on the Kennedy assassination and Watergate. Next. Here we have the Masonic Jewish Zionist Kissinger and the Knight of Malta Alexander Haig, whose brother is a Jesuit, working together. Next. Kim Philby, not a Malta, British Secret Service, CIA, KGB, with his counterpart, James Angleton, not a Malta, the KGB, CIA, working together. Next. John Courtney, Courtney Murray, the advisor of Henry Luce. Luce oversees the, is part of the assassination of Kennedy. He buys his Zapruder film for $150,000, locks it up in a safe for five years until it was subpoenaed by Jim Garrison. The wonderful Shriner Freemason, Earl Warren of the Warren Commission, and the Shriner Freemason, Lyndon Johnson, who was a great benefactor of the Kennedy assassination, speaking at Georgetown University. Okay. Next. Luce and his wife, Claire Booth Luce, Dame of Malta, part of the uh, intelligence community. Next. Guess who we have here? <laughs> A dear friend of mine sent this picture to me, and I just had to 
put this up here. Here we have the temporal coadjutor Oliver Stone with his brother Jesuit meeting in Cuba. Now we have sent a copy of Vatican Assassins to Oliver Stone. We haven't got a word back from him. I wonder why. And I even recommend go buying JFK Director's Cut because it's the tr most truthful thing I've ever seen. Two brother Jesuits doing their dirty work, probably planning somehow on the invasion of North America through Cuba. Next. That's the Muslim invasion that I told about before Al-Qaeda was brought to Guantanamo. The Iacocca involved in the Kennedy assassination. He was rewarded for it and made the president of Chrysler. Next. Madame Malta. <clears throat> now here's something really important, and I'll, I'll try to finish with this. The Jesuits were never told this about Iraq, but in 1968, the Jesuits were expelled from Iraq, uh, Al-Kahima, that was a university there, and given five days to leave. 1969, all Jesuits are expelled from Iraq. Could it be the last 20 years of bloodshed and war on the Muslim Iraqi peoples was for their expulsion? at the hand of that Jesuit stooge, Saddam Hussein, who gassed his own people? I think maybe. Next. And here's William Casey and his brother Jesuits at the Fordham University. And Casey, of course, was the head of the CIA. So we see a Jesuit connection with the CIA. Next. Here's Thomas Smolk. He's the Jesuit provincial, the California provincial. He is the master of Gray Davis. He'll be the master of your new governor. And I'm sure he knows all about the Chinese invasion into Long Beach, for which Los Angeles will most probably have to be neutralized. I tend to think that there will be some kind of a scare or a, or a biological release or some kind of a low nuclear device going on in Los Angeles to secure a beachhead for the Chinese coming. And this guy knows all about it. He's a provincial. You have the provincials, you have the assistants, and then you have the Jesuit general. Go ahead. Here we have the president of Ireland, past president of Ireland, who started that thing, as I mentioned. And there's your master, William G or Joseph A. O'Hare. And here's Rockefeller and Kissinger all working together. The Jesuits control the Council on Foreign Relations. The Je Council on Foreign Relations belongs to the Archbishop of New York. Next. OK, fascism next. Oh, the Jew Room. The National Security Agency has called a Jew Room. No Jews are allowed. I thought the Jews run this country. No, the Jesuits run it. And pursuant to the Jesuit maxims, we're not letting a Jew in the order. We run the National Security Agency. We're not letting any Jews in this particular uh, and most important room either. Next. The order of, the, the order of hatred of the Jews is traditional. And Loyola himself hated him. The Jews couldn't have a physician unless they submitted to the ministration of the peace, of the priest. Next. And there he is, Jesuit general Peter Hans Kolvenbach and his general staff. Next. The most powerful man in the world. No man is more powerful or greater than this man. We should respect his power. We should learn as much as we can about him. He speaks eight languages. He was garrisoned in the Middle East for 17 years. And he's the perfect man to carry out this Middle Eastern war. I saw him in person one day at the Jesuit novitiate in Warnersville, Pennsylvania. And here's John F. Kennedy. The American century, the black pope has ruled, killing usurpers worldwide, those liberals, those fools. For resisting Rome Caesar and his bold temporal power, I was shot down in Dallas at half past the hour. Thirty-eight years have passed while my blood cries aloud, justice, O oh justice, to earth's highest cloud. Is there no champion my cause to plead to punish my killers? Is there no need? The temple's money changers I did chastise. The Cold War and CIA I likewise despise. Just as the death of Messiah who foreknew his ends, my only son has been wounded in the house of my friend. Wasn't long ago, folks, till they killed his son. And if his son would have been elected, things would have happened. He was, had $100 million. He knew the Jesuits were behind the death of his father. He had his own magazine, and he had every intention of doing something about it. They, blow the ta they blew the tail off it, and those bodies were full of shrapnel. That's why, that's why his lovely uncle, that not a Columbus lunk, uncle of his, Ted Kennedy, guarded those bodies and would not let anybody see them until they were cremated. I think I have to stop. I've given my 10-minute. One more little thing. 
Here's Mrs. Bush. Look who's on her committee. J. Peter Grace, Jr., Nida Malta. Prescott S. Bush, Jr., Nida Malta. And James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones working with the Knights of Malta, who you hear AT&T every time you call it. Okay, well, I'll have to stop for now. I think you have a general idea. And uh, 